Uh, we're in the middle of a series called Friend, and it's a series in the book of James. We're in James chapter 2, the very end of James today, verses 14 to 26 we'll be reading. Today's message is called Living Faith. Living Faith. We've been talking about faith and how James uh, is a bit annoyed with the church and their definition of faith. And so this week, James makes a contrast of two faiths. A friend of the world has a faith that is dead, a dead faith. And a friend of God has a living, perfect faith that we get to witness through their actions. Now, if you're here today and you don't believe in Jesus or you don't follow Jesus and maybe you're exploring and seeking, then what you can do is you can see what does it look like? What, what is the church supposed to look like? Because James is talking to the church and he's talking to people that have confessed Jesus, that come to the assembly, come to the congregation every week and their confession or their friendship doesn't line up with who they're supposed to be. So if you are here and you have thought, man, the church is a bunch of hypocrites, then you are in good company with James because that is why he is writing this letter. He is tired of church hypocrisy. And uh, we really get to see, man, James, James goes at it. You know, we, we've talked about, you know, some of the, the harder moments, but James really lets it loose today. So we're going to have a lot of fun. You can read with me on the screen right here. I'm going to start off in chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. James says this. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is going naked and lacking daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham's believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So there are two arguments that James is making in this passage that we're going to go over today. The first one he uses to prove the second one. And the, the first one is this. Faith that does not lead you to action is a dead faith. If your faith does not lead you to action, it is dead. It's useless. It's the faith of demons, James says. Secondly, James is closing out his larger argument that we've started in the end of chapter 1 about how the church should treat the poor. Or really, I should say, the lack of godly treatment that the church has had towards the poor. So to really bring home his, poor, his point on how the church should treat the poor, he paints this grander picture, this grander theological understanding of how faith works hand in hand with our deeds. So first, we're going to talk about this treatment of the poor that James is talking about. He says in verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is going naked and lacking daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. 
So we see, like we said, from the, the ending of chapter 1, James has a bone to pick with the churches that he's writing to. They have gathered, they have confessed faith in Jesus, they have said that they are the church, but they have consistently mistreated the poor. The first thing that we read that they did is they put the poor person at their feet when it came to justice, when God has given them the kingdom of God. The second thing that James says they have done is they have showed partiality towards others, which has left out the poor when God shows no partiality. The third thing James has a bone to pick with them about is that they have sought their own desires and have talked a lot rather than actually going to the orphans and to the widows and visiting them and their affliction to show the love of God. James adds to that list today. He says that you are using religious language to mask your mistreatment of the poor. They are using religious language to mask their mistreatment of the poor. Right? The religious language that they were using was this. They would say, go in peace. This was the standard Christian goodbye. You know, if you're saying goodbye to somebody, uh, you know, if you ever meet somebody really spiritual and they end on their signature for their emails, grace and peace or go in peace, you know, like this, this is, you know, scripture, spiritual goodbyes. So you, you're leaving from one another in church, and you say, go in peace, brother, go in peace, sister. But they were saying that to brothers and sisters in the church who could not even clothe themselves or feed them. Imagine you come to church, and you have not been able to eat. Maybe you're malnourished, you're hungry, you didn't have enough to have breakfast that morning or dinner the night before, and you come around a lot of people, and they're planning to go out of where they're going to binge on for lunch after service, and then you can hardly clothe yourself, and as they are going to the new restaurant or the spot that they want to try, that they say, go in peace, brother, go in peace, sister. What kind of peace are you proclaiming over me? Why James has been so upset with the church begins to come into focus in this passage here. Right? It's maybe hard for us to understand in America why this may be an issue. But if you look at the world economics, you realize that I believe the last statistic I read was around 2 billion people survive on $1 a day in the world. That is a staggering statistic. So just by virtue of being born in the United States or living in the United States, you are well above the poverty level of the world. So even the poverty level in the United States, if you are below the poverty in the United States, you still have things like running water, you still have a bathroom, you have uh, government amenities, you have all these things that put as a whole our country above the poverty level by far around the world. Uh, I was listening to a podcast by I believe it was the founder of Dell this week, and you know the, this podcaster always asks a question at the end of whenever he interviews a founder of a big company. He says, you know, how much of what you have achieved is from luck, and how much of it is from hard work and intelligence? And the founder of Dell, you know, if you heard his story, it was a lot of hard work, but he said, you know, the, I, I worked really hard, and I did... You know, a, a lot of it was, you know, the, the late nights and the 15-hour, 16-hour days. But, you know, the luckiest thing, I think, about my life is just being born in America. Uh, because you realize the opportunity, the things that we have, is not something that is afforded everybody. So when we read this passage, sometimes it's hard to imagine what Paul, or sorry, what James is talking about here. You know, Come with me, imagine a service for a minute that you go to where most of the people had to walk for miles to get there. And they don't have shoes, they don't have running water, and they don't have a stable source of food. But imagine that not everybody in the congregation is like that. Let's say we have our congregation and then there is a large part that is coming, maybe you know, 20, 30 people that come that are in this situation. They can hardly dress themselves, can hardly, they, they don't know where their next meal is coming from, and they enter among us, and we look at them, we worship with them, we tell them that we love Jesus, and then we leave service at the end of the day, and we say, go in peace. 
Well, this is what was happening in the church. There were people of very little means among them. And they were not taking the ownership that they should have taken to provide for those people. And so James is incredibly upset. We would really begin to agree with James that his argument here that faith without works is dead, it no longer becomes a controversial argument in this situation, but it actually makes a lot of sense. How can you be a Christ follower yet have a brother or sister in Christ that comes every week, does not have food when we have food that even our leftovers could be enough for them to eat? John puts it this way in 1 John 3, 17 and 18. He says this, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how, how, it's like how sway, that's in my head right now. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. See, the early Christian fathers really connected faith and work. That was never separated from them. And a lot of times we have separated in our gospel, our gospel presentation of what faith does in our lives, that it never transforms us to act, to look, and to do the things that Jesus did. Right? John is asking here, how willing are we to enter into the mess of our neighbor with action? And our willingness to enter into the vulnerability of our neighbor really is the thing that proclaims our faith before Jesus. You know, and if we think we're exempt from this today, then uh, we're not. We have religious language too. This is my favorite one. We actually talked about this in uh, membership class today. You know, I would say the standard goodbye for Christians today is this. I'll pray for you. Tim Keller said the biggest Christian lie of all time is when one Christian says to another, I'll pray for you. Right, really, a lot of times what we're saying, and there are a few of you that when you say that, you mean it. You actually go home and pray. And I'm not talking about you right now. I love you. Thank you for that. But, you know, many times what happens is somebody will tell us about what they're going through, and we just want to go home. And so what do we do to end the conversation, our standard goodbye, so that we don't seem cheap or we seem Christian-like, is we tell the person, I'll pray for you. And what we really mean is, man, I got things to do, so let's wrap this conversation up. I really don't want to help you, don't have time to help you, so I'm going to move on at this point. And the only way for me to move on is to throw some religious lingo at you to feel righteous and spiritual and be able to go on with my day. Back then they said, go in peace. Today we say, I'll pray for you. But really what we mean is, I don't really have time for you. Um, how do I extend my hand to push me farther away from your situation? Right, we're not asking these questions. These are harder responses. How can I help you? Right, if you think about the standard, I'll pray for you, 99% of the time, how can I help you will fit just as well. Another one, how can I pay for that? That's another good response. These are harder questions, right? Maybe we have heard from a mom that school is coming up and they don't have the resources to get everything that they need for back to school. And we say, man, that sounds rough. I'll pray for you. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Well, what would it look like if the church instead said, how can I pay for that? Can I, do, can I, can I pick you up? Let's go to Staples together and let's ring everything up. How, how can I pay for that? How can I help? You know, maybe there isn't a way I can help, but maybe I can mourn with you in a situation that you're going through. Maybe I can walk with you through it. Maybe I can go to your house and pray with you in person. Maybe, maybe I can just 
take you out to the movies to, to lift your spirit up. Maybe you have nowhere to go during the holiday because you're alone. You don't have family around you. How can I invite you into my life? How can I help you? And this is what James is getting at is we use religious language to mask our desire not to do. And we feel good about that. Who doesn't feel good when they leave a conversation and says, I'll pray for you. Because I pray for you just many times means I just have to talk about it, but I don't have to do anything about it. Jesus made this point clear. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 to, 39, to 40, he says this. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when we did see you hungry and feed you or thirsty, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? They didn't understand what he was talking about. When did we see you in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you do it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. You know, it's interesting about the people that James is describing, the people that Jesus here is describing, hungry, hungry, naked, strangers in a land. Many times those living on the margin in these scenarios, not clothed, not fed, if they do not receive help, they will die. And what James is saying is that if you do not give them help, your faith will die with them. Now, you cannot look at your brother or your sister in need and never extend a hand to help because as they perish in their situations, so does our faith in Jesus perish. This is powerful stuff that John testifies to, that Jesus testifies to. Our faith cannot be, as James said before, in talk. It cannot just be a hearing, but it must be a doing. That when we are taking care of the vulnerable, when we are helping people that are in need, what we are really doing is Jesus sees that same work to them as work being done to him. So we cannot say, man, if, if I was around in the time of Jesus and I saw this happening, I wouldn't do what Peter did and denied him. I wouldn't do what Thomas did and doubt him. I wouldn't do what these guys did and, and be depressed when he was gone. Or I, I would have been there when he needed it. I would have, I would have made sure that I, I gave what I had. I wouldn't be like the rich young ruler who turned away when Jesus said to give all that he had to the poor because it's Jesus telling me I wouldn't have done these things. And it's very easy to convince ourselves of this. But Jesus' argument is this. If you do it for them, you would have done it for me. If you wouldn't have done it for them, then you wouldn't have done it for me. You know, what's great about this is this is actually one area that I've been proud of our church in. You know, we're a very new church. We've been here for a little over a year and a half now. But I've seen community in our church happen and take care of the needs of others. I've seen new mothers have meals prepared for them. I've seen a community who gives away things to one another instead of sell to one another. I've seen people drop what they are doing and help somebody that needs to move or somebody that needs a place to stay. I've seen people that have been in crazy situations where either their apartment burned down or, or they, they, they didn't have a place to sleep that night and other people band together and say, man, how can we pay for that? How can we help you? How, you, you can stay with me here. You can, I, I, whatever you need, let me help. And so my encouragement is this, that this is the church. 
You know, this is not just something that we should find in a special community here and there. What James is saying, what Jesus says, what Paul says, what John says, is this is the true church. This shouldn't be a special case that you find here and there. It should be the daily actions of people who confess faith in Jesus. So my encouragement is, church, let's continue to do this. Let's continue to be a people that learns to lay down our life for our brother and our sister. That learns to say that worldly goods are not more important to me than helping out somebody who is in need. That every time I help with providing for somebody, I know that I am providing for Jesus. That I'm not looking to get something back from everybody. That I'm not looking for how I can reap a great reward. I'm not looking for congratulations. I'm not looking for the praises of man. Jesus says that the people who look for the praises of people, their reward is when people praise them. So that's, if you want the praises of people, fine. That's your reward though. But the reward that Jesus gives to the things done in secret is a heavenly, eternal unimaginable reward that he has waiting for those. This should not be an accidental way to live. What it should be is a culture that we culminate with one another and continue to practice day in and day out as a church. It should be the purposeful thing that we do the kind of people that we are, when we talk about our values, community, discipleship, and creativity, when we look at community, when we talk about what real community looks like, it says this, man, I have times of prosperity and you may have times of need. So in my times of prosperity, I will give to my family in need and maybe they will have times of prosperity or other people in the church will have times of prosperity when I am in need and they will be able to provide for me. That is what true community in the church looks like. And what James is arguing for here. And to prove James's point, he makes this broader theological point. That faith without works or without deeds or without actions is dead. He says in verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Whenever someone drops foolish in the Bible, you got to understand, like, whew, you, you are like, you know, you're taking off the gauntlet, you're slapping them in the face, and you're saying, duel. What you got, brother? You know? Like, that's what's happening right now. This is... This is, this is throwing salt in the wound. <laughs> Jesus said the same thing, but he puts it this way in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who has faith, not everyone who confesses, not everyone who believes, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Some of us have been duped by either false teaching or just wanting to hear honestly what we want to hear. That all we need is confession. All we need is belief. Faith that is not at work in your heart producing good deeds is a dead faith. That is the crux of it. We cannot argue any other way when we look at scripture. If belief in Jesus and his word has not begun to transform your heart mind, and soul, then there is something wrong with the faith. I love how James puts it, because I just love when people get gangster, especially in scripture. He says, if you believe that God is one, right? If you are monotheistic, if you have belief in the one true God, he says, you do well, right? If we remember in the beginning of chapter two, he said, if you follow the royal law, you do well. He was being serious. Now he has a play on words. He says, if you believe in God, you do well. And he is basically being incredibly sarcastic. And how do we know that? Because the next line he says, yeah, you do well. Even the demons believe. 
Yeah, good for you. I'm glad that you love that you, you believe in God. Good job. You and the demons can have a party with your belief together. Even the demons believe, and guess what? The demons shudder. They don't just believe, they believe. They know the power of God. You see that in Mark chapter 1, verse 27, and Mark chapter 5, verse 7. The demons know who Jesus is, and they are scared of him. They are frightful of his power. So James is saying, if your belief does not lead you to obedience, then you have the faith of demons. Ah. <laughs> oh. It's like turning the knife a little bit right now. The definition of faith must, must, must include not only belief in Jesus, but belief that leads to actionable change in our life. If it only includes belief and does not include deeds, then we have the wrong definition. We have the wrong definition. We have so much false theology going on out there that it is, you know, it's me and my television. It's me and whatever I want to believe. It's me and God alone, and I can continue to do whatever I want. I can pick the scriptures I like. I can pick the preaching I like. I can pick the sermons I like. I can pick the translations that I like. I can pick the commentaries that I like. I can pick whatever I like, as long as it fits within the mold where I get to continue to do what I want to do. And that is the faith of demons. On the flip side, the truth is this, that deeds without faith is dead moralism. This is the religion of the Pharisees and what Paul is constantly fighting. Jesus called the religious people the Pharisees who had a lot of good deeds but had no faith in him. He said, you are like whitewashed tombs. You wonder where James gets it from. You know what a whitewashed tomb is? You know, a tomb is a tomb that looks really pretty on the outside, beautiful, sparkling white. But what is on the inside? Death. Decay. God knows what else. That's what Jesus says a, a life of just doing good deeds but never having faith in him is like. It is living like a whitewashed tomb. You know, on the surface of reading the scripture, it may seem, for those of you that understand Paul's arguments and James's, that they are in conflict. And you know what? Nothing further can be from the truth. They are not in conflict at all. When you read scripture, this is good for everybody that reads on their own. Hopefully that's most of you, but if not, I'm praying for you. <laughs> When you read scripture, you have to understand that every scripture, all the books of the Bible has a author, and that author has an intent, and they're writing to a specific people. That's why at the beginning of every sermon, I try to remind you, what is the author? What is his intent? Who is he writing to? So we remember, we don't take what he is saying out of context. So Paul is writing to one type of Christian. James is writing to another type of Christian. They are writing to two very different audiences for two very different reasons. James is dealing with people who are being lazy Christians at the end of the day. They are not allowing the transformative power of faith to be at work in their life. They are adding Christianity as a compartment of their life instead of letting their faith in Jesus be fully transformative of their entire life. That is who James is writing to. Paul was dealing with the Pharisees, people who thought this, that works of the law, i.e. circumcision and Old Testament rituals, would save them. People that thought, man, as long as I, on the outward, just get everything right, that will be enough for me to get into heaven. As long as I'm circumcised, as long as I follow the rituals of the Old Testament scripture, that will be good. 
And so Paul argues deeds without faith in Jesus is useless. Circumcision and the rituals of the Old Testament cannot save you. James argues faith must lead to good works being more like Jesus. Not dead rituals or circumcision, but loving your neighbor as yourself, the royal law. Two very different things. Paul is arguing against works of the law, never against good works like loving your neighbor. James is arguing for good works and never for works of the law like circumcision and rituals. Really important distinctions. And we see unity between Paul and James here. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul says this, For in Christ Jesus, what is he arguing? Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. These do not save you. They don't matter. But only what? Faith working through love. Faith working through love. What is James arguing? Faith must come out and love thy neighbor. This is the royal law. This is what we have covered for the last two weeks, that if this is not where your faith is taking you, what your faith is working on your heart and your mind for, then it is not faith. Action spurred by your faith in Jesus matures us as Christ followers. And the minute that we stop allowing our faith to transform and to change our actions is when we stop maturing and we start working towards a dead faith. James then gives two examples of this. First is the example of Abraham. Right? If you don't know the story of Abraham, Abraham is one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. He was the father of many nations, the father of Israel. This promise that God made to make Israel his people came from Abraham. God made a covenant with him. Abraham believed in the covenant. God said, Abraham, you got no kids, right? You're old. You're not supposed to have kids, but I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm changing your name from Abram to Abraham meaning father of many nations. And then by a miracle, him and his wife, Sarah, conceive, and they have their first child, their only child, Isaac. And then God tells Abraham to do something with Isaac. We see this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. It says what? By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, And he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son. I want you to understand what's happening here, right? God says to Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. Through you, I'm going to bless everybody. You are going to have tons of offspring. Look at the stars. As many stars as you see, that's going to be your offspring. Look at the sand. As much sand as you see, that's going to be your offspring. Okay, great. You have one kid. Now I want you to sacrifice him to me. You know, this is basically, imagine God told you, I'm going to make you really wealthy, right? I know God tells a lot of people that, so we're going with this one. (laughs) Imagine God tells you, you're going to be rich, 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 rich. And you're just like, okay, God, I believe. Mm. Yes. Come on. Where's that altar call, buddy? And then God says, now give away all of your money. He's like, no. How am I going to be rich, God? I can't be rich by giving it all away. That doesn't make sense. Then the question you have to ask is, did you really believe God? You didn't. Because God makes a way. His ways are beyond our comprehension. We don't understand his ways, and who are we to question him? And so Abraham has this one kid, and God tells him he's going to bless him with a ton of offspring. And then God says, with your one kid, you're not going to have another kid. Now sacrifice that one kid to me. Abraham doesn't go, God, you know, simple math here. If I get rid of this one, we don't have others in the pipe. (laughs) 
we're old, you know, this is, this is not happening again. God says what? Do this. Abraham's like, all right, I got you. So he goes and he does it. What happens? You know, spoiler alert, Isaac never gets sacrificed. An angel stops him right before he's about to knife him. Y'all never read the Old Testament. Y'all think I'm crazy. The Old Testament is crazy. Go read it. That's why Jesus says to the Pharisees, he says this in John 8, 39. He says, they answered him, Abraham is our father. Oh, I love Jesus. He says this to them. If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. Meaning, come on now, you don't have real faith. You are whitewashed tombs. You say you are like Abraham, but Abraham had faith in me. The second example James gives is Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute living in Jericho. And God's people were coming to take over Jericho. And Rahab meets these two spies running around. And she says, listen, I know that your God is going to win, that your God is the Lord God Almighty, that he is great. And guess what? I believe in him. But you know what's about to happen is the soldiers are coming to find the spies and they're about to get killed. And so Rahab doesn't just say, I believe in God, now enjoy, go run and hide. Let's see if the soldiers catch you or not. She goes, no, come into my house, I have a hiding spot. When the soldiers come, they're not gonna find you. Right, her faith led her to action. And because of that, she made it into the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. Uh, Y'all didn't know about the Hall of Fame in the Bible? (laughs) A.K.A. the Hall of Faith. But if you read Hebrews 11, it's filled with people and stories of the Bible that says what? They had faith in God, and when they had faith in God, they did this. Because they had faith in God, it led them to do this. It led them to do that. It It led Abraham to go and offer his son. It led Rahab to take in the spies and protect them. It led Abel to give a better sacrifice, right? Their faith led them to do something every single time. And James is saying to the church, if your faith is not leading you to help the vulnerable and the poor among you, then your faith is dead. The point is not that works give life, but that they express life within When the good fruit, the good deeds begin to come out, what is that an expression of? That God is doing something in your life. When you can't watch the same things that you used to watch, or you can't listen to the same things you used to listen to, you can't be around the same things you used to be around, you can't do the same things that you used to do, what is that? That is faith working in your heart, producing good works. What kind of faith do we have as a church? Is it one that leads us to action, to loving our neighbor? Or is it one that allows us to comfortably lie to ourselves about who we serve? A friend of the world has a dead faith that never causes them to action. A friend of God, like Abraham, has faith that moves them. Moves them to help the needy and the vulnerable. Moves them to lead a holy life like he is holy. Moves them to devotion to the word and obedience to Jesus. Church, let's not be religious folk. We know all the right things to say. We know all the right things to have an appearance of. But inside, have a dead faith. Let us have a living faith. That daily causes us to put our trust in God and to act like Christ. A faith that moves us every single day to do things that we could not conceive ourselves of doing. Maybe years ago or weeks ago or days ago. You know, yesterday I take about a half an hour to read journal entries of three years ago. Yes, I journal. That's how true it is. And this is why I like to journal, 
Because as I read these entries, I was writing about things that I was struggling with in my heart. And just the, the pain and the agony that some of these sins were causing me in my life and some of the idols that I was seeing. And as I reflected yesterday and read those things, I thought, man, God, you have done so much in my life in the last three years. You have changed so much about my heart. You know, I, it's, it's, sometimes it's, you forget what God has done. Forget to worship him, to praise him. But that is what faith should do. That we would be able to look back, look at our life and think, man, look at what faith in Jesus has produced in my heart and in my mind. Look at us who, look, look at who it has caused me to be. Now, when I look in the mirror, I don't see who I used to see anymore. Maybe it's not as dreadful as it used to be. My heart is not as sick as I once was. The wounds aren't festering anymore. The only way that happens is if faith is working in our life to produce the things that Jesus has for us. Living hope. Can you stand and pray with me?